Hello, everyone. So uh, let's start the class today. Today, we are talking about combinatorial games and the games of them. But actually, we already talked about perfect and imperfect information games. Here, uh, the main goal is to uh, consider some special kinds of games for which there are uh, more efficient algorithm to find the best strategies. And these are more combinatorial algorithm, more mathematics, and in particular, the games of NIM, which are an uh, important one in the class. So uh, let's talk about combinatorial games. So, uh, combinatorial games generally is a two-player game, which is a perfect information in the extensive form games. Uh, two players, P1 and P2, finitely many position and the fixed starting positions. The player strategy is set of move from his current position to another position, just a regular one. And generally this is the case. The player who cannot do any move loses the game. Play always ends and players have complete information about the past and thus the game is perfect information and here we don't have any probabilistic move in this combinatorial game. Some uh, famous examples are Go, Chess, Checkers, Tic-Tac-Toe, Hex, meme games that we talk about and Neem is a very important family of these graphs that we will talk about them and we give a few examples of them. There are some games that they do not look like Neem games, but at the end it becomes Neem game. And here, I mean, for example, in the chess, someone may say that, oh, the game may not end, but actually there is some, we have the definition of tie that if you cannot do a checkmate, then the game would be a tie. So it ends essentially. And there's no randomness. Good. Uh, let's go to this nimble game. A simple game. So here's a two player combinatorial game. You put uh, some coins on the um, strip. You say the numbers, one, two, some numbers, integers. <coughs> So you have some coins there. The people take turns. They are moving just one coin to the left. So one of this coin, you can essentially move to the left. You can jump over the other coins or even go completely out of the six. And you can have any number of coins on one square. A player who cannot move the game, that player loses the game. <clears throat> and the question is that, have you seen this game before? I mean, this, as we talked, there are some other similar games in the NIM games, they are actually the same. So here at each time, note that there is no color for any player. They can just take it. This is some initial configuration and each of the each time you can take one of this one and then move arbitrarily, maybe they come here even, or they can go completely out. Person who cannot do the move that will be essentially the loser of the game. Let's see another game in this category. Actually the NIM game, original. So, let me clear everything. Okay, so NIM is another to player combinatorial game. You start with n piles of heaps, so there are n piles. So there are n piles. And each of them, uh, say each heap or piles has at most m stones. 
player take turns to move, and in each turn, a player select one of the piles. For example, this one. And takes as many stones from it as he or she likes, perhaps the whole pile. But at least one stone. So there should be at least one stone to take. It. But you can take arbitrarily from one pile. A player who cannot move the game, who cannot move, loses the game. And now, this, this is a perfect information extensive form game. We can draw its game tree that we will do. But <laughs> before that, note that this Nim and Nimble are the same game. Because indeed, uh, you can think about in the previous example that we discussed uh, here, as you will see here in this uh, Nimble game, you can consider actually each of this coin to be corresponding to a, each of this coin would be corresponding to a pile. Why? Because you can take any, you need to move at least one and you can make it completely up. So in some sense, this game actually is a NIM game. So Nimble is a NIM game, but it's just representing maybe in a different form. But here, each coin here is corresponding to a pile of stones that we are talking about. Uh, great. So having said that, let's go to the the extensive form game for this game. So let's see how many moves do we have and what is the size of this tree. So name from computational point of view. So if you want to do that, this is the essentially this uh, game tree that we draw it for that. So let's see what is the size of the branching factor. So B is the branching factor, H is the height of the tree, maximum depth of any terminal node. And as we have seen, the number of nodes in this game tree is B to the H. So essentially factor B, and this is uh, not... You remember we had it B here and then B to a square and then I don't know, B to the H here. And that's essentially, or H minus one, but this is the main <clears throat> dominating term. What about B and H for name? So in the, what about B equal to branching factor? So uh, how many moves do we have? We have, uh, again, these are the things. We have n piles, and from each of them, I can take, say, 1 to m, the maximum. So it would be n times m, the moves that I can do it. So branching factor is the number of moves that I can do it. What about the height? The height, I mean, it can be also n times m, because each person can take only one stone at a time. And how many stones do we have n times? M? So b, the branching factor, again, the number of strategies that the person has it, is n times m, h is n times m. So the word complexity that we have would be b to the h, which is n m to the n to the power of n m. If we just think about n is equal to five and m is equal to one hundred, which can be easily actually done in the nimble game because these are just a strip of one hundred, then you can see that would be a huge things. And we cannot do anything there. So here we try to also understand and do some exercise of this um, game tree and game tree representation and computations for the name games. Good. So it seems very inefficient. Can we make it more efficient? So let's go and see what can we do. So one thing that we can do to improve the running time, we can use a technique called uh, memoization. Memoization is a technique for improving the performance of recursive or backtracking algorithm. Actually, if you go to my introduction to algorithms course, when we talk about backtracking, uh, dynamic programming, etc., I talk about it. And 
in some sense, this is a technique that makes backtracking algorithms more like dynamic programming. Uh, so what is the idea is that, I mean, we try to avoid memoization. We try to avoid recomputing, recomputing something that has been computed before. So in a sense, you want to see what is the current strategy, what is the configuration that we have for each configuration. If we have enough space, then we can see what is the status. Whenever we come here, we compute it once. The second time that we will come, we have the result already. We don't need to do any computation. And recursive calls can look up the result. So if the array is essentially, we can assume that this array is first is all filled in this null or NAN. And then anything that is computed, it will be some number. So if it is not NAN, we will just get the result. Otherwise, we need to compute. And the main thing is that this memoization improved performance of this partial results. because we never uh, calculate them again. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, so here, all these things that we discussed, for example, uh, what would be the size of the array or the thing that we need to keep it? So here, this is the thing that, what should be this array that we want to see? We want to say, what would we, we need to keep track of the winner for each possibility of piles of a stone. So uh, each pile, have at most m stones. Got it. So these are again n piles. Each of them have at most m stones. So each of these they can have, I mean, m to one or zero essentially. So we have m plus one configuration that each pile can have it. And then uh, we have n piles. So this would be m plus one times m plus one m plus one, which would be essentially m plus one. So that's the configuration for each of these things, because we need to say that if this file is in this shape, this file in this shape, this file in this shape or configuration, who does win? Okay. And then that would be easy, because if you know you reach here, then the other person gains, then you can compute was the winner before that. So that would be very easy. It is an easy exercise that you can see that if we have an array of this size and we will calculate essentially who would be the winner in each of this configuration, it is very easy. And the mouse that we will pay is the size of this array because you can say at each time we are essentially maybe another factor n or m more, but that would be essentially the dominant term. So, the size of this array, which is essentially the running time of this algorithm, would be m plus 1 to the n, which is, of course, much better than the previous one, nm to the nm. But still is not great. We cannot do this one, and it may take a long time to see if you want to play this game, if you want to write a computer program to play this game. Can we do better? And that's the thing that we are talking more about math stuff, essentially. Good. So let's go and have a, a deep dive into the problem. But let's start with just two piles. See what will happen with two piles. And then we go. So here, say we have uh, two piles. One has size K, the other one has size H. This is the mathematics that we want to talk about. If K is equal to H, then the second player always can win. Otherwise, the first player can always win. So we have, whenever we have this, if K and H are equal, then second player wins. If they are not equal, the first player wins. The proof would be by induction on k plus h. I will to mention this proof first. Then there's a simpler way, but this proof I want to extend it. The first proof. So let's do the induction on k plus h. 
the basis of the basis of induction is that when k plus h is equal to zero, if k plus h is equal to zero, there is nothing essentially. Of course, in that case, uh, second player wins because there is nothing to do that. And k plus h is equal to one. One of them has only one. Then in this case, other one nothing. Then the first player wins because it takes this one. There is nothing for second player. But that's correct for the basis of induction. Now let's. Uh, Say that this is the induction hypothesis. Say for k plus h less than p, the statement of theorem is correct. Again, it says that if k is equal to h, then the second player wins, can win essentially if plays smartly. Otherwise, the first player can always win. So what about, so we know the situation for less than p, let about, uh, let's talk about k plus h is equal to p. Two cases again. Here, if k is equal to h, after any move of the first player, say, I mean, k is equal to, so say R stones from one pi, it's k plus h, so these are uh, essentially um, k is equal to h. This, I mean, so here, this is the, so this is non equal case, so this is the equal case. This is k and this is h. So he's taking, or she's taking R of them. Then, because these were equal, it takes R, then in this case, uh, we have two piles, we have K minus R and we have H. But we know that K minus R is not equal to H because they were equal, now they are not equal. So in that case, we know that they are not the equal case. If they are not equal case, this the first player wins, correct, here. But here, the first player would be the second player. So our original second player now becomes the first player, and it wins. So what's the meaning of that? It means that in this case, the second player always wins, as we want. Again, if k and h, the first person takes r, then they become non-equal. Then by assumption of the theorem, by induction hypothesis, because they are not equal, in this case, the first player wins. But first player now is the uh, second player originally, so second player originally. That's the case. Now, what about if k is not equal to h? <clears throat> Say k is less than h in this case. So here, in this case, uh, actually, uh, the first player can just uh, get h minus k from this one. So this is the first player. So first player is doing that. Take this H minus K things. And then it takes them, then they become equal. Now, when they become equal, and you know that the size would be less than, for the way, both of them, the total size would be less than P because some non uh, zero things will be removed. So then we can apply the injection hazard. In that case, then we have the equal case. In the equal case, the second player wins, but the second player here would be the first original player. So we have the result. <clears throat> so that's essentially proves this, but there is also a little bit uh, simpler things that I wanted to say. For the case of K equal to H, you can think about this. This is the mirroring technique that actually uses uh, in lots of games. So when k is equal to h, it's easier actually to see that why the second player wins. Because anything that the first player is doing in one of these, take r of them, the first player, I will take, the second player takes the same r from the other player. Maybe now this person is taking from here, I don't know, r prime, then again, the second player comes here and from the other one takes r. So always you can do the mirroring move. As long as there is a mirroring move, uh, in any games, the second player wins because anything that either the first player cannot move, in this case, the first player lost the game, or if he or she can do the move, the second player, because always there's a mirroring thing, the second one can move. And so, if they are, you can, this is a simpler way to do that. If that k and h equal are equal, then you can do always do mirroring move. If k and h are not equal, then the first player just make them equal by the first move, and then the first player becomes second player after that, <clears throat> and can do the mirroring move. So the second player wins, which is the original first player. That's essentially a simpler way to do that. But I needed this uh, 
injection hypothesis because that would be uh, interesting when we have more than two piles. In that case, the mirroring might be not trivial. Uh, good. Let me clear everything. So let's consider any number of piles. This is the, essentially this is the generalization of being equal. So we have again uh, these piles. So these are the piles that we have, not equal necessarily. And say their number is A1, A2 to AN. These are the pile sizes. So we will write each number in the binary number as a binary number. Add the piles modular two, or essentially X four of them in each column. And the final non-negative number is the NIM sum of piles. So this is the definition of NIM sum. So how do we do that again? We'll write A1, A2 to AN as a binary format. Then in each of these columns, when we write it, then we will essentially take the XOR of them. Uh, if the number of ones essentially is odd, it would be one. So odd would be one, even would be zero. For each column we are writing there. And at the end, we get some number in binary that would be the nibs. Let's see an example. So say we have three piles. One of them have size six. Other one, uh, one has size four and one has size three. But maybe I should actually uh, do it a little bit uh, nicer, this one. It's a bit, uh, but this is six, this is four, and this is three. Okay, so let's write these numbers in binary first. This is A1 to A1, so A1 would be one, one, zero, six would be one, one, zero, four would be one, zero, zero, and three would be zero, one, one. Now, you need to add each piles, uh, essentially. So these are the things that we are just writing it. Now add the piles modular two in each column. So again, those that there is nothing, we will put zero. So here, there is, uh, I mean, this is the X or of them essentially would be only one, or you can say odd number of them, so it would be one. Here would be even number of them would be zero, even number of them would be zero, so that's the thing that we will get zero. But this is the number. This one is a NIM sum, which is, is one, it say, it, could be like one zero one, which would be five. There's some number essentially that is called the NIM sum of this case. So for any number of piles, we have these things. Now, what do we have? So this is the definition of NIM sum. Write them in the binary. Then each column, according if the number of them are odd, we will put it one. Otherwise, it would be zero, and that would, we will read this number, the binary number, make it essentially a regular number, decimal number. Good. And that would be the, of course, it's non negative because everything is positive here. Good. Let's see what will happen. So, this is the theorem that we have. This is a generalized theorem. If the NIM sum is zero, it means that if all of them are zero, then the second player always can win. Otherwise, the first player can always win. So we just, this is a generalization. Note that in the particular case, if K and H are equal, then these two numbers essentially have one number that I write it again, correct? Then in this case, this would be zero because uh, this is always uh, even number. So zero, 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 zero. So actually K is equal to H is a special case of this theorem. We said that if this num NIM sum essentially is zero, second player wins, otherwise the first player wins. So 
How do we do that? <laughs> Again, we are doing the induction on A1 plus A2 to AN, the same thing that we have done it before. The basis of induction when some of them are equal to zero, if there is nothing, then of course the second player wins, or if there is only one, essentially the first player wins. So that we know that. Now let's do with the induction hypothesis the same as before. Say if A1 plus A2 to AN is less than P, then the statement of theorem is correct. What about if A1 plus A2 to AN is equal to P? This is essentially based on this fact. If the nim sum is zero, we will yeah, talk more about it. After any move of the first player, so if the nim sum is zero, after any move, the nim sum always becomes non-zero. And thus, so we know that like these are p. So after the first thing, if they are um, zero, then after the uh, any move you will do that, we will show that one. The nim sum become non-zero. So in this case, we know that by induction hypothesis, because it's non-zero, then the first player wins. But the first player currently is the original second player, so we get the results. If the nim sum is non-zero, then again, we show that the first player can always make the nim sum zero. And this, you can do it by taking from only one pi. We show that. This is, this is not a trivial one. We need to show that. Then we can take essentially one of these, if there are this, if the nim sum is not zero, we will take one of these. We can take some number that it should be designed or divide intelligently. Then you can just remove them and make the nim sum zero. So in that case, then the, uh, then the second player wins. But the second player here is the original first player. So we get the result. So there are two things that essentially remains to show. The first one is that if the nim sum uh, if the nim sum is zero, then uh, any move that you will do it, the uh, and of course we are assuming that is uh, the number of p is greater than zero, so like the p is greater than zero. So if, in some sense, if there is any possible move exist, because if p is equal to zero, some of them are equal to zero, so in that case, there is no move is possible. So if there is any move is possible, then the, uh, we can show that the nim sum become non-zero. And the other one is that if the nim sum is, uh, is non-zero, we can do it one move and make it zero, and then we are done. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing is this one, that the zero nim sum becomes non-zero after each move, and the other one is that non-zero nim sum can become zero after a move. Good. Okay, so let's talk about this one. <clears throat> so zero nim sum becomes non-zero after each move. Say we have a, a essentially a zero nim sum, like this is the case. This is a general case, but this is just some example as well. Say the first player chooses a pile i and takes it's number of stones, uh, essentially, and makes the <clears throat> it's number of stones something AI prime less than AI. What's the meaning of that? So <clears throat> we have some numbers. Say uh, this is the this player one. This is the first player, correct? The nim sum is zero. The first player needs to take one pile, say I pile, without lots of generality. And then it makes it, after removing any number, makes the remaining number of uh, essentially stones, they're A prime I, which is less than AI. By definition, it should take at least one. Good. So that is everything without loss of generality. I is the one that is getting it, and AI was the original one. A prime I is the remaining number. Now let's see what will happen. So we want to say that the nim sum of these things, so if we are, instead of AI, we are using A prime I, then it always would be 
non-zero. So consider the first bit from the left that a i and a prime i are different. So we will go from left from here. <clears throat> and the first bit that these two are different. So here, for example, the first bit was actually this one. Uh, this is the, this is zero and this is one. So I mean, it could be actually something like this. It could be this one, zero, zero, one, and could be zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So uh, here, the first bit is actually just the first bit, but it can be here if you just come from the left, the first bit would be actually this one. And because uh, we know that uh, A prime uh, is less than AI, there should be such a bit essentially that they are different when you come from the left. The first bit you can do it because AI would be less than this. So there should be one that this is one here and the other one is zero because A prime I is less than it. So what's the meaning of that? So like this is the this is the point, this is the columns. So so far everything was fine, we didn't change anything. But here, this is the only difference that AI and AI prime, the first one. We don't talk about the other one. To make it non-zero name sum, I only need to show one one appears here. So here in this column, if you see that, this is the column. So in this column, then before it was zero. So the number of uh, essentially ones was even. Now I change essentially one of them from one to zero in the new name sum. So of course, then it makes it odd, then it becomes one. And I don't care about the other one. It can be zero, it can be all zero, but there is at least one, one that appeared in the zero sum, maybe more than one, but that means essentially that uh, I am in a good shape like become non-zero. So this was actually the easier part that says that uh, if we have a zero name sum, if the first player takes from any pile i and make it uh, any number and then make it some a prime i less than that, then always the name sum becomes non-zero. That's the thing that we want to show that. That's essentially the uh, first part that we have, we talked here. So that if the name sum is zero, then uh, so that if the name sum is zero after any move of the first player, the name sum becomes non-zero. So now the second one. We want to say that if the name sum is non-zero, the first player can always make the name sum zero by just taking from one pile. This is a bit non-trivial. We need to see how can we do that. Let's go and see this other one. Good. So Say we have a non-zero name sum and we want to say it can become zero just after one move. Again, write these numbers in terms of uh, binary. And uh, now I want to say that from which one I should take essentially something. So this is this is the strategy that first player is uh, free to move. So he or she can decide which pile it should take it and how many. So I should, after that, the remaining number for the remaining number, if we do the whole name sum, then it becomes zero. So consider the first bit. Um, okay. Now we will come here. Consider the first bit from the left in which the name sum is one. So we know that by definition, the name sum, is, we have a non-zero name sum. So if you write it in binary, there is one of them, which is like it should be, at least one should appear. Say so consider the left one. The left mouse one, which is one. So, so you know that here in this column, it is one. It means that the number of ones here should be out. It means that there should be at least one AI. It might be more than one. Maybe it is five or three or something. But there is at least one AI that here it has a bit one. And we just focus on this case. So arbitrarily, if there is any of them, we can just focus on this. Only one of them that it has the 
one here. It might be more than one, but there exists at least one. So, what do we do here? We are starting from here, this one here. Starting from this, this is the important thing. So how much remaining, I want to say that. So when I know how much remaining should be there, then I know that I need to, this player should take AI minus A prime I. So this is the num number of stones to take for the first player. So we are talking about the first player. So there is this one here. No, starting from this, I don't have, so this is, what is the A prime I? So the, so far I don't change anything. From here, I will start any place. So I will, starting from this position to the right, I will go from here to this direction. I will re reverse each bit of AI if the corresponding name sum bit is one, to get the result. So here I will come here. So here, it is, so this is one, correct? So I will just reverse this one. So I will make it zero. The next one is one. So I will make this one. So it was zero, I will make it one. I will reverse it. Here it is the name sum is zero. So I don't change it. So no change here. So here, again, the name sum is one. So if this was zero, I will make it one. This here is one. So I will, again, name sum is one. So I will reverse it. So from zero, I will make it one. Here, these guys were zero, zero. So I don't change it. I will keep it as. First, note that what will happen. Because of this definition that we have it exactly. So everything else was zero by definition because that's what the left mouse one, which was. So everything was zero. So here, by this changing, any time that this, this number is odd, we make it even. So that's essentially the result in the new sum by definition, which is all zero. The question is, why can we do that? This num the main importance is that we want to make sure this A prime i is always less than AI, which would be the case. Why? Because the first one, that was one that we made it zero. So it was important. If this was this guy was zero, I couldn't make it one because it was a bigger number. It means that I need to add to this five. But because it was one, I make it zero. Then I have essentially the luxury that everyone else, I want to change it from zero to one because this would be always a, a, a smaller number. And that's essentially the main catch that we need to find the one, the first one to make it zero instead of the first zero to make it one, the first one that we will make it zero. But after that, I have essentially enough uh, energy or anything to, I or have enough luxury to anything else. I can make it from zero to one, but this new number would be always less than AI because the most uh, important bit essentially, the left most bit essentially was one for AI and zero for A prime I. That's it. So that's the move that we can always do that. And as I mentioned, the number of decreases would be AI minus A prime. This A prime is less than I. Uh, the first different bit from the left, the most significant bit of the difference is one in AI and zero in the other. So we are done. So that essentially we have proved it. So if it is zero uh, name sum, any move that the first player is doing, it becomes non-zero and if it is non-zero there is a way that you will take one of these piles and take some number from it such that the whole name sum becomes zero and that proves the theorem now this was essentially a deep dive this was the mathematical understanding of the game that happens essentially in lots of the things it may happen you may play chess and for part of it actually you may use this kind of mathematical uh, reasoning. So you don't need to do it for the whole game, but you may do it for part of the game. In some sense, this kind of evaluation function that when we cannot go anything down, like when we reach the depths of the tree that we are considering, and after that, we need to guess what is the evaluation of the current configuration. That is also some kind of mathematical thing similar to this. But anyhow, so uh, let's see uh, what about in terms of computational issues? How did we do with this new theorem? 
or mathematical understanding. No, we have essentially improved the running time a lot. Why? You want to see that uh, uh, to find out who always win the game, we only need to compute the NIM sum for the NIM sum. So we have uh, n piles. So everything that all this kind of game tree and memorization all can be simplified now. We have essentially these numbers that we have. We have n numbers, and each of them is at most m. So it means that each of them I have at most like m number of bits. I have n of them. So if I write these ones, so the total number of bits that I have it would be n times log m. So I can just write them essentially and just compute this mean sum that who wins. And the whole running time would be n log m comparing to the m plus one to the n or n, which is a huge improvement. And again, if you want to compute at each time also, you can compute compute the nim sum, whether it would be zero or some. Uh, it is very easy to compute the next move as well. That would be very easy as well. And by the algorithm, essentially, that I have mentioned, how you will change the things. So we improved it by a deeper understanding of the game. Uh, great. Okay, let's see another game. This is actually another interesting. It is called Games of Soldiers. So this is a bit different from the NIM games. And as I mentioned, NIM games actually is lots of problems become NIM games, and you can do that. It's just this is what the simplest thing you can read more about them, like you can get from ChatGPT or essentially search the web, you will find lots of other applications of lots of non-trivial games, which are actually the NIM games. So let's see this other game, Games of Soldiers. What is this Games of Soldiers? So the games of soldiers is this. So here in the general typical name, we don't have any color or something, but here say this one. Games of soldiers or Northcott's game, it is also called. So in the Northcott's is another two player combinatorial game. There is just one checker of each color on each row of the checker. So there is like two, say we have blue and red. One blue, one red here. Player takes turn. Each player in each turn to move, a slide one of his or her checkers, any number of squares in its own row. So you can think about this one that here, there are two player games. And uh, here we have two games, two persons essentially. One is the black, one is the blue person, the other one is the red person. And then uh, this, these are blue and red, and then you can take at any time. So these are one in each row. And at each time, you can take one of your, essentially, if you are red, you can take these red ones and essentially go any number to the left or right, such that you cannot jump over the opponent's checker and you cannot go off the board. So you need to be always board essentially. So essentially two players, they have this thing and they can just play this out. And then the person who cannot do the move, that person essentially puts it again. So this game is another one, which is, a, this is actually a NIM game. It's a NIM game, but with a caveat that they have mentioned here. This caveat is important, actually. So I want to leave, I mean, a good exercise for you, but I just want to give you some hint, essentially. So in some sense, this is, you can think about this game is very similar to the NIM game. So in the NIM game, you could actually, they had several heaps, and in this heap, you could just remove some of this now, some of these people, some of these stones. So in some sense, in each time, you can actually, you could um, only decrease the number of stones in it. 
But here, the catch is that, for example, here, if these are like, if you consider this row, this player can, instead of, if it moves like this, that would be like heat, then the space would be less. Uh, and essentially, you can say, define, for example, the heap, the number of stones in the heap is the number of spaces between these people. However, you can see that this person may move this way, so it can increase the number of people in the heap. And that's the thing that makes the problem non-trivial. Can do the problem essentially non-trivial because it could just decrease. You can see that is actually very similar to name. I mean, still you need to think about it, and that's a good exercise. But the issue is that they may increase the number of hips. But if they can increase the number of hips, then I mean, number of stones in a hip, then uh, it's not necessarily the name game. The only hint is this one. If someone is just increasing the number of stones in a heap, in that case, so if this person, for example, goes from here to here, this other person can also do the move here to come here, such that the distance between them remains the same. So this is the caveat, essentially. If somebody increases something, the other person can always also just do this essentially this kind of mirroring move such that it does not allow that the size goes up. The size remains the same. This is essentially the main catch. So essentially this would be a name game because and the same thing you can think about it and then essentially uh, uh, formalize the whole thing. But this is the idea that this is the name game if you consider the number of stones in each pile is the number of free squares here essentially that would be the number of stones in each pile and the issue that one person can increase the number of stones but the issue that whenever this person essentially increases the let me just do this one maybe it's just doing a different color here that would be cleaner so for example if here this person is doing this move uh So if this person is moving, doing this move, this person can also do this move. And in this case, as you will see, the number of things here is equal to the number of things here. So if one person wants essentially somehow, it's not a cheating, but if you want to increase the number, then the other person can also just decrease the number to the same number and essentially remains the same. And you can see that after some point, the catch is that this cannot continue forever because this person is coming here, then it needs to come here, comes here. At some point, it cannot go out of the board. So it needs to stop at that point. And that's the time that, uh, so this person is coming here and then at the end it comes here. At here, we cannot increase it anymore. So at this point, then it needs to decrease it and that becomes it. But that's essentially the idea. If you want, I mean, you can place this one with, uh, any other person, and if that person does not know, this is a regular board game, and it is interesting. If that person does not know that, it would be very hard to uh, for the other person to win. But if you know the math behind it, then you can actually win this game. And yeah, so that's the final thing. There are lots of other ones. This was just that becomes essentially name games. There's, I mean, a lot of theory about names, these name games. You can read about them. It's quite uh, non-trivial. Mention more the uh, basic of it here, but you can uh, read more about it and you see lots of other games. That's actually very nice sort of games, this kind of combinatorial games, uh, which mainly essentially are names and its variants. Great, so I uh, just stop here.